Um, you can head on to the next slide here. Um, so I've just got a quick intro. I'll be on the left here. And my co-authors are Zachary Dunseth and Daniel Plekov. Go ahead, Tori, and just push forward. Um, so I'm presenting to you today from Drumheller, Alberta, Canada. I'm in Treaty 7 land on the ancestral home of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Sutina, Siksika, uh, Métis 3, and the Stony Nakoda people along the Rocky Mountains. Um, my co-authors here, they're from the Joukowsky Institute for the Ancient World um, and Archaeology, and they're at Brown University. You can go ahead, Tori. I've got my notes here on my computer too, so I'll just try to read along. All right, there's going to be some animation, so please click ahead. I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Phytalus here before I dive into things. So silica is absorbed from the groundwater and it's deposited with, oh, okay, within and between the plant cells uh, within a plant. Um, when the silica hardens, it takes on this shape. Um, here you can see some typical phytolith structures from the inflorescences and leaves of a plant. And as a phytolith analyst, um, much like a pollen analyst, you become adept at recognizing these shapes, which I'll call morphologies, and categorizing them to plant types or plant parts. Most commonly, we retrieve and we examine these phytoliths from sediment samples. And in theory, that can be easy, but in practice, it can be difficult. And so um, it just depends on the sediments that you're looking at in regards to how you do this. So Tori, you can go ahead, please. Um, so why are we talking about processing methods? There are a few advances in the last 15 years in this phytolith research and how to process your soils with we have clearer and more standardized identifications, but a lack of standardization for our processing protocols. This is largely due to the varied nature of the sediments that you um, get your phytolith from, uh, but it doesn't mean that protocols can't be transparent. So the goal for our presentation today is an eventual uh, short methods paper on how to make our processing methods very transparent. So you can go ahead to the next slide. There are many sweet processing protocols out there for extracting phytoliths from soils, but you can go ahead, Tori. Um, two more, if that's okay. But we'll be focusing on one protocol today, the one center screen here from Alberto Lombardo and colleagues, published in 2016. This protocol tests and advocates for increased use of ultrasonic vibration, which is also called sonication, in order to, and I have a quote here from the article, improve the efficiency, efficacy, and the safety of phytolith extraction from sediments. You can go ahead, sorry. Um, so I've used a few different protose processing protocols before with sediments, and I'm focusing on the Lombardo method today because that's perfect, because it's suitable for clay-rich sediments, and it's more intensive. It generally produces clearer slides, but it can be tricky. So when I was working on an assemblage from Petra, uh, there was just way too much clay um, in the soils with the processing protocol that I was using, which you can see on the left-hand side here. These are the same magnification, just different processing protocols. Um, so the methods that I used really utilized sonication, this Lombardo method, which is essentially using sound waves to vibrate things at a micro scale and break those bonds between sediment components and phytoliths. You can go ahead, sorry. Here you can see the heavy sonication method, and you can click again, where they have four processing procedures with slight alterations in their methods in order to gain a fuller understanding of this processing method and to share our techniques. You can click again, Tori. Zach, Dan, and I had a vital workshop, and here you can see we walked through the fourth processing method here called UO, which stands for ultrasonic oven. Click ahead. In preparation for this day, what I essentially did was I prepared a cooking show type, <laughs> like style of processing with one sample, which is an external control sample outside of an archeological site, just from the periphery of the site, where I would halt the processing methods at different stages of the processing and mount that sediment onto a slide. So you can click ahead. We were interested to see what this looked like and we were mainly concerned about what suggestions, what tips and tricks we could share amongst ourselves in order to have our methods crystal clear and as standardized as possible. You can click, thank you. So what did we learn? The authors uh, don't explicitly state beginning the method using 10 grams of sediment. You can click uh, where they write about how many samples they used and how many times they divided that sample. So I think it's clearer to just state that right off the bat. You can click again. One may be tempted to increase the RPMs or the time of your centrifugation as you go through this processing protocol because there's so much centrifuging. Um, you will, you might think that you'll be centrifuging effectively or that you'll cut down on your time, but in fact, this will just cement your sample to the bottom of your tube and then you won't be able to mix the sediment. Click 
click again. This may come as obvious, but identify your samples with your um, identifier. And I would encourage doing this so that you can match up your most like weighted samples to balance your centrifuge. This is not just about the effectiveness of centrifuging, but about safety. You do not want an unbalanced centrifuge and have a notebook handy and write down everything you do because you just don't know when you'll be interrupted in the lab or how you may want to compare your processing methods um, down the line. So having a detailed and organized processing protocol will help you in the long run. You can click ahead. Allotting yourself enough time for the sediment to react with your chemicals. Ah, you're so good at this story. Thank you. Um, will not only be easier and safer, um, but it will be much more effective. Give yourself enough time. This protocol does not state a quantity or volume of hydrochloric acid that you'll be using to get rid of your carbonates in your sample, only that 10% hydrochloric acid will be used. You can click again. I would break up the sediment in between your drying um, stages as this will allow pockets of minerals to have the necessary reactions with your hydrochloric acid to then rid the sample of carbonates. Uh, the glass stir, so please click. The glass stir is really handy for this, as well as managing the bubbling that will inevitably happen with your samples as you are trying to get rid of those carbonates. Um, and you can click again. I give my details here, but I'm not going to go over them. On to the next slide. Um, if you can find crucibles that are shallow and wide, I'd really encourage it. This will allow for even distribution of access to air if you're using an oven to get rid of your organics in your sample. The ones pictured here will not fit your 10 grams of sediment. These are what we used for our modern plant combustion. So on to the next. Okay, Tori, this is going to be crazy. Uh, so I'm going to go into the phase three, which is flotation. And in this part of the protocol, we found um, possibly like a problem, but we have a solution. So. I'm going to walk you through the flotation steps here. So click with our sample in a 50 mil tube, tube one, we added, click again, 15 mils of sodium polytungstate, which was set at 2.3 grams per milliliter. Tube one, following the protocol, tube one is centrifuged at 3000 RPM for five minutes. Following centrifuging, the phytolith, you're doing so good. The phytolith will be suspended in the liquid here in the top. You can click again. You're then going to pipette 10 milliliters of this SBT of the floating fraction, which contains your phytolith, into your second tube. This leaves, you can click, 5 milliliters of our initial SBT in tube 1. And we're going to repeat this twice for a total of three times. So another 15 milliliters is added into tube 1. And we now have 20 milliliters. You can click again. A 2.3 SBT in tube 1. And it's centrifuged again at 3000 RPM for five minutes. You can click again. For a second time, 10 mils is transferred into tube two. And another 15 mils of SBT at 2.3 is added. And we now have 25 milliliters of 2.3 SBT in our tube one and 20 mils in our tube two. I hope that this is all making sense to people. You can click again. So for the final time, 10 milliliters is transferred over to tube two. Um, for a total of 30 milliliters of SPT into tube two and 15 in tube one. And most of our phytolists, you can click again, most of our phytolists here will now be into uh, tube two. So you can click Tori. Um, and we can essentially discard tube one now. So click again, please. Awesome. And I think Perfect. So our next step in the protocol is to dilute the SPT with DI water. And in order, we are doing that in order to alter this SPT liquid, the, the density. Awesome. Um, to sink the phytolist to the bottom of the tube and rinse and recover the precious sodium polytungstate, which is now in our tube too. You normally would not mount your phytolist in a solution of SPT unless you want temporary slides. Given that we're working with 50 mil tubes and the largest set, oh, nice. Okay, thank you, I can hear your timer. Given that we're working with 50 mil tubes, the largest that you can order and fit into a conventional centrifuge, we now have a maximum of 20 mils left to work with. So if you just click through, Tori, um, after completing this process a time or two, I had a suspicion that the liquid specific gravity may not be, oh, do you mind going back? Sorry, may not be enough to sink the phytolus all the way to the bottom. So if you do calculations on this and according to phytolus specific gravity that range from 1.5 to 2.3, we have a potential problem here with the specific density of our liquid. So I'm sorry, now you can go to the next slide, please. Our recommendations include it 
following the protocol from Katz et al, where they use 2.4 grams per milliliters of SPT, you can click again, please, um, and take your time and you can divide these two tubes and dilute them further rather than keeping them into one tube. On to the next slide, the summary, perfect. For every processing pro protocols, there are going to be advantages and disadvantages. And for a few assemblages that I've seen from North America to Petra, the Lombardo method has literally turned cluttered, really messy slides into um, clear and dependable slides that you can count and identify phytoliths confidently on. Reliable phytolith analysis would not be possible without experimenting with different protocols that are suited to the sediments that you're working with. So could you click ahead, please, Tori? Overall, we think that researchers and students and professors should consider the techniques that they're using, justify their use, and be curious about what they're doing. Experiment with the protocols that you use and talk to others who might be using the same techniques or working in similar areas. Okay, thank you so much for listening. You can go ahead. Uh, thank you to my co-authors and to Boston University, um, is, which is where I, I completed this work. Oh, I see the thumbs up. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I look forward to the comments and suggestions. Please let me know what you thought of this talk um, and how a short methods paper would help. At Lottle Archaeology is an entirely female-owned and operated consultant company. Um, we offer a range of archaeology and laboratory services that include phytoliths, like you saw here. You can check us out at our website. You can also please write to me on my Gmail, and you can get these slides on my research gate and my academia. And if you just go one more, Tori, there's just a references slide um, that's included in the PDFs. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Tori. <laughs>